This ancient Himalayan kingdom, where less than 10,000 people live, nestled itself between Tibet and some of the highest peaks of the world. It was created in 1380 and its Tibetan name, Mutong, means fertile plains. After almost six centuries of independence, it's been integrated to the Nepalese territory in 1951 to finally become a province of the state in 2008 after the fall of the monarchy. It was forbidden for foreigners to visit the country until 1992. We can now cross or discover it with a special and expensive permit costing $50 per day, which nonetheless preserves the country for mass tourism detrimental to the country and its population. Its fortified capital, Lomantong, stands at almost 3,900 meters of altitude on a mineral plateau that is swept by squall and daily sand whirlwind. The Mustang district is an exceptional jewel with verdant plains, patchworks of various cultivated fields, with rivers and tumultuous torrents. It shelters perched villages of limed walls and flat roofs. The landscapes are vertiginous, the mountains spectacular with beautiful colors, sprinkled with prayer wheels, compass, and shortens, Tibetan stupas. To reach this part of Nepal, you have to take the unique and still under construction road that runs along the Kaligandaki River and surrounded with Dolagiri Peak, 8,172 meters high and the Annapurna, 8,078 meter high. It's a genuine adventure that we are on the point to start from Pokhara with an Indian jeep, along with a guide, June, and a driver, Bijaya. They will reveal themselves very precious. Our program, going up to the capital of Mustang to assist to Tiji festival, the most well-known and venerated ceremony of the ancient kingdom. The first day gave us the color very quickly. Ten hours of chaos on the roads, drowned with mud and violent storm, reducing the visibility at 20 meters in front of us. In the mid-afternoon, we reached the first verdant hills of Mustang, full of waterfalls. We really understood what road under construction meant when we stopped for an hour because of an electric shovel digging the mountain. The Nepalese are used to that kind of stop and joyfully relax themselves. Rivers, when dry, become traffic lanes like any other one. We reach our first stop at dawn. It's in Marfa, a little stone village at 2,700 meters of altitude. Early in the morning, we discovered its Tibetan monastery in the heart of the village. The narrow streets paved with stones add a real charm to Morpha. Doors and windows are delimited with cherry trees panels, red lines on rustic white walls. The place is peaceful and serene and surrounded by mountains and dominated by Dolagiri. The entire region is famous for its apple production. Here they make cognac, cider and delicious apple pies. It's a bit afternoon, the violent and freezing wind rose up slamming the flags.
We left the verdant valley of Marfa for Kakbeni, the door of High Mustang. An offering and adoration ritual named Puja takes place at the edge of the river. One of the participants tells me that it's a particular puja happening once in a year to pay homage to the ancestors. On the path leading to the monastery lies a pile of stones engraved of mantras or religious texts. This kind of pile sprinkled Mustang. A recent monastery where novices play in its courtyard share the place with the most ancient of Mustang. The burning orange color stands out in the blue of the sky. We drive at the edge of Kaligandaki River on a road in the heart of sumptuous Orker and Red Canyon. Then we quickly went 1,000 meters up between wooden hills, mosaics of cultivated fields, and crazy mountains to reach Muktinat, a place located at 3,170 meters of altitude at the bottom of Thorong La Pass. The ceremony is taking place in the village monastery. It's called the Gompas. It gathers a large part of the inhabitants. Gompas are the keepers of sacred texts, called tantras, that monks interminably chant. Tonkas are hung on the walls representing Mara's life will or previous lives of Buddha. They sing sutras, the texts are attributed to great Buddhist masters. They sing sutras in unison. Some texts sung in the ceremonies are mantras. It's a rhythmic musical pattern based on repetition of sounds that are reputed beneficial for the body or the mind. A dinner is served to the inhabitants in front of the monastery. Sharing is part of their relationship. In Mustang district, religion is linked to every action of human life. In a quest for a better life, the Mustang inhabitants call several gods to protect them and fight against every spirit that poison their daily life. This communion with the superior world and the protecting gods is everywhere and under multiple forms. Manis, amulets, prayer flags, chortens, prayer wheels are omnipresent in the landscape. The sun disappears behind the mountains and the temperatures suddenly go down under 10 degrees Celsius. In the morning, we walk 250 stair steps to go to Vishnu Temple, one of the eight holiest temples of the world. It was a hard task considering the altitude. In the surroundings lie 108 water sources where faithful take their sacred bath. Many pilgrims coming from India and Kathmandu Valley run to it. Offerings are deposited. They burn incense, splash and collect the sacred water or have a bath in one of the two basins. Pujas take place all along the day.
A hundred meters away from the temple, an enormous statue of Buddha sits on the platform where faithful come to pray. It dominates Muktinat and offers a splendid panorama on the Annapurna. In the end of the morning, we continue our trip to Chuksong. The village high of 3,000 meters is constituted of three hamlets, Tongma, Braga, and Sikyab. These hamlets constitute a very active farming community. On the other side of the Kaligandaki River, a red and orca huge cliff dominates the landscape. It's pierced with multiple caves. We cross the river to stroll in the old village. Several houses are collapsed or roofless. Some families still live in the one in good state, lost in a maze of narrow streets. We find all the complexity of belief in the demons' traps, often placed above doors. We go back to Chuksong by the suspended metallic bridge and the wind is particularly violent. The guest house we are staying in has a terrace giving a fantastic view on the cultivated plain and the cliff. The field work has already begun. After a healing night, a warm shower, the last before long, and a copious breakfast, we walk until Titang and Samar, two of the most beautiful villages of Mustang. The multicolor mineral environment is dazzling, temperate with many wheat fields still green. Several chortens are erected from afar. In these two villages, the dwelling's architecture is complex and unusual, but the most impressive is the effort dedicated to the construction and the maintenance of the terraces, the irrigation canals and the retaining walls. Some field zones are connected to the arterial canals with underground aqueducts, going under intermediate fields. The most difficult task here is the transportation of tons of silts from the river to the cultivated lands. This one is collected in dug special distributors, then mixed with domestic manure before being transported in baskets to the fields to enrich. Stones pile are numerous in Samar. And the view on the mountains is breathtaking. We hit the road again toward Geling. In front of us, the Kaligandaki River is getting narrower. From Pokhara to the Tibetan frontier, the under construction road is a phenomenal construction site that we discover a bit more day after day, such as the trekkers who walk among dust clouds and wind gusts. Countless earthwork vehicles, electric shovel, dump trucks enable the way. More than 2,000 engines have been bought for this one construction site. This road project is a priority for the Nepalese government to open a commercial access to China. The wind, the winter weather conditions, and the ground instability add to the incredible difficulty of this task, which is driving on this road. 
The landslides are frequent and the circulation is often interrupted to let the shovel dig the mountain. Today, we'll wait two hours for the engines to clear the way before continuing our trip. Sometimes the roads are nothing more than piles of pebbles and stones on which hurtle torrents of water that make motorcycles and all-terrain vehicles struggle a lot. On a particularly thorny passage, our 4x4 got stuck on a rock we couldn't have foreseen in a turn under the cliff. We tried to free it several times, but in vain. The wheels were turning in the air because the bottom of the vehicles was on a big rock. We raised the back of the car with a jack to put pebbles under the wheels in the frozen water. Thanks to the help of locals, we finally managed to extirpate the vehicle after more than an hour of unsuccessful trying. What was supposed to be a two-hour trip became a six-hour one. Geling, or Gilling, is a small village with sprinkled dwellings and is located at 3,500 meters of altitude. After a night in a basic lodge, we stroll on a few footpaths and discover a sublime chortens with a wall of prayer wheels glowing of ochre, orange, black and white colors that are characteristic of high mustang. We see a second one further up on the hill a vanguard of the two gompas that dominate the village. The first monastery named Tachi Chiling is very ancient, forbidden for women and closed. We could finally visit it thanks to some bills. Wall frescoes are splendid and in a perfect state. The monk who accompanies us shows us, like a trophy, the sliced and fossilized hand of a thief dead a long time ago. The next step will reveal itself the most beautiful of our trip. Dakmar is a small village located at 3,800 meters in the peaceful valley of Gemi. It's built at the edge of monumental red and ochre cliffs that create one of the most spectacular landscapes of Mustang. According to the legend, the red color would come from the ogre's blood named Balmo while she had a fight with Guru Rinpoche during the 8th century. The three chortons announcing the village are surrounded by pile of stones and make the place of an incredible beauty. In the heart of the valley where the grass is tender, horses peacefully graze. In the end of the afternoon, after field work, women gather to talk and share together.
The sunset on Dagmar's red cliffs is a unique moment that we won't forget. The next morning, we survey the streets of the village and walk along the limed wall houses. We are inside one of them. A young novice Bones practices the radong, a Tibetan trumpet, with her professor, and the monks living there recite sutras. Further on, a woman plasters walls bare hands with a mix of manure and silt. On the road to our last step to Lomatong, we cross Tsarang with its beautiful sculpted chortens and its monastery, 4th century old. The village is on a 3,500 meters high plateau and offers a fantastic view on the Annapurna. While strolling in the narrow streets of the village, we randomly find a tiny two-classroom school. One has four students and the other one has three. In a small food place where we stopped to refresh ourselves, two women are making momos, a Tibetan ravioli steam cooked or fried depending on the taste. In the middle of the afternoon, we reach Dalbat Pass, just above the Mustang's capital, at 4,000 meters of altitude. The wind is extremely violent and it's almost hard to stay upright. The small city of Lomatong is the historical capital of the ancient kingdom of Mustang. Its inhabitants learned how to cultivate the dry land beaten by the winds and they edified a unique fortified city in which currently live 700 people but several thousand of goats. We discover there secular dwellings, royal and religious buildings and the people speak Tibetan. Lomatang kept its ancestral aspect, a city with no cars, no neon signs, paved streets that give a medieval look and a discreet and peaceful life. To go there in an adventure, it takes four to five days of walking, two to three days on horseback or at least two days of four by four.
It's a challenging journey that we lived, with several paths at more than 5,000 meters of altitude. Its inhabitants are all practicing Tibetan Buddhism, like in the rest of Mustang. The Himalayan peaks keep the monsoon away, which limits the agriculture to few harvests, wheat, barley, and some vegetables. Goats and semi-wild yak breeding add to their poor resources. In the end of fall, the whole population load horses with handcrafts products of their own making, like weaving or the making of tonkas and other painted images, to start a long transhumance toward the Pokhara Valley to trade and spend the winter in bearable living conditions. Spirituality is present everywhere, in old men's eyes turning their prayer wheels, on pristine white shortens or on innumerable multicolor prayer flags. The marked faces are the witnesses of time and hard life condition in the hostile environment. The smiles reveal their kindness. Each year during the month of May, Tenji Festival is, for three days, the most important religious ceremony of Mustang. It celebrates the victory of Dorj Sunam, a reincarnation of Buddha, who fought the demon Matamruta in a legendary past. Hundreds of men, women and children walk several days in the mountain to assist to this ceremony. They bring offerings for the monks such as food, firewood or some money. Each village also sent a few precious amounts of wheat and barley used to make small doe statues seen as the incarnation of demons this festival is aiming to remove. The monastic celebration of Tiji is a good time for many Lopas, who are the inhabitants of Mustang, to wear their most beautiful outfits, wonderful turquoise head ornaments and prayer wheels. Dances with masks, also called sham, allow the spectators to enter, for some instant, the esoteric environment of Vajrayana Buddhism. The first day of the three-day festival, the Lama present in the very old Shode monastery of Lomatong meditate and perform until the night Vajrakila ritual. Vajrakila is a deity of Vajrayana Buddhism, it's more precisely a Heruka, which is an angry and furious shape of Vajrasattva, a Buddha who purifies karma and who concentrates the energies and wisdom. This practice is based on confession and purification. In the Tibetan Buddhism, some deity can have different frightening shapes. The angriest the shape is, the most spiritually effective the practice of the ritual will be. Its powerful anger is directed towards its enemies and in particular toward the demoniac forces of ego along with its several destructive emotions such as hatred, desire or jealousy. Moreover, its role is to cut the emotional or cognitive schemes that imprison the believer and keep him from being free of their egos and progressing on the spiritual path. The second day in the late morning, many people gather on the square in front of the royal palace. The place is washed, swept, and novices paint circles on the floor to determine where dancers will be, and around 2 p.m. the festival begins. The monks takes place in front of the royal palace where stands a giant tonka that represents the founder of the Tibetan Buddhism, Guru Rinpoche. The king of Mustang is dressed with pageantry and assists the festival. 
His role is now purely representative. Indeed, in October 2008, the monarchy has been abolished in the state of Mustang by the Nepalese New Republic's government, and the ruling family is now nothing more than a lineage of Raja, among many others. Dressed with their multicolor outfits and hats, the Lamas dance the Engacham that evocates the birth of Dorje Sonam, which is an incarnation of Buddha. He is the demon's son. It's a calm dance with slow steps called Toele. <laughs> The next day, after the sacred tanka deployment and several benedictions against it, the monks wear very old wooden animal masks and twirl with the drum's rhythm to terrify spectators. It's a challenge from the evil genius Mantamru, led through a dance named Sacham. comes the representation of the kingdom attack whom demons wants to seize. Lamas perform different religious dances to cast out the demons from Lomatang.
After a stop in Gemi to have breakfast, we start our way back down to Pokhara in the early morning. We quickly face the problem of deteriorated ways. Complications are at different places on our way back and the state of the road is our main and permanent trouble. After more than 10 hours of travel, we reached the beautiful village of Kagbeni around 5 p.m., located between two rivers, the Gandaki River and the Jonkola River. We assist to the fantastic sunset on the Nilgiri mountain, which highest peaks reaches 7,061 meters of altitude. We wake up at 5 a.m. for the biggest day of travel in 4x4 between Kegbeni and Pokhara. The day starts with a car breakdown, which delays our departure from Kegbeni of one hour. Driving on this one and only road, on one way or the other, we realize how struggling it is for workers and villagers who work hard to build or fix the way with laughable tools compared to the immense difficulty they encounter. Recurrent landslides, torrential runoff, erosion of the river's edge, the retaining walls collapse, the interruption of the work from the beginning of autumn to the end of spring due to climate issues or lack of financial means. Nepal is among the 25 poorest countries in the world. The arrival at Sarankot, located above Pokhara, is a true benediction. We gained 10 degrees going from 12 to 32 degrees. We stopped to enjoy the splendid panorama on the Fiwa Lake, which borders Nepal's second city. Bandipur is a small Magar village, one of the country's most important ethnicity, and is located at three hour drive from Pokhara and five hours from the capital. It's one of the ancient caravans road between India and Tibet at 1000 meters of altitude. Bandipur has a rich commercial past and kept its nice red bricks houses with open front walls, which is New World Dwelling's typical architecture. It kept tiny and narrow streets with a user-friendly atmosphere in which we are pleased to wander, and its beautiful Nirari temple of Bindabasini. Life is peaceful and serene, tourists are surprisingly rare, no motorcycles or cars, which is an appreciable break before the craziness of Kathmandu. In the evening we climb on Gurungshe Hill to see the sunset. It takes 30 minutes walk to go to Tanimai temple and from the top of the hill the panorama is breathtaking on the city and the mountains around. After an incredibly annoying and crowded last trip to Kathmandu, we spend our two last days visiting the most exceptional places starting with Pashupatinath. Pashupatinath is built on the edge of the Bagmati River, the most sacred river in Nepal, and is an important place concerning Hinduism cult. The Golden Roof Temple is Shiva's home and is inaccessible to non-Hindu person. Shiva lies in its center and takes a peaceful and benevolent shape of Pashupati, who is the herd keeper, the soul's gatherer, the one who watches over Nepal's kingdom. A bridge allows us to cross the river and access to a long stair bordered of several shaitya made with large grey stones. It's also a place full of contrasts, life alongside death, the mercantile activity of trinkets sellers, 
faithful coming from everywhere to pray, the ghats for people belonging to the high castes next to those destined to impure people from low castes, the renouncers looking for holiness among beggars disguised in sadhu, the holy man, women wrapped in their luxurious sairies among men almost naked and covered with ash, the Brahman praying before the office, taking place in a ceremony near the tourist. From the vast promontory that overhangs the place, we can see the cremations cast on the other side of the river. Dead bodies are wrapped in a shroud and lay on the floor. Then they are brought to a funeral pyre. Members of the family walk three times around the pyre carrying the dead. They put it on the pyre and cover the body with straw. The fire is lit and the body is set ablaze. The family stays here for a while before going down to the river for the purifying ritual bath. The dead will slowly burn and its ashes will be thrown into the river. Bodnat is known as the tallest tupa in Asia. It has been for a long time the arrival point for caravans crossing the Himalayan mountains. People were coming to thank the Buddha if the travel was good. The Buddha's eyes are painted at the four cardinal points. It has an observing look on men and their actions. This important center of Buddhist pilgrimage has been edified in 600 by a Tibetan king. A crowd of pilgrims gather to do the Kora, which is a circumambulation where they ritually turn around the symbol and throw praying wheels containing the sacred words in a fronting carousel. The most beautiful city of Nepal, Bhaktapur. It's an ancient imperial city, sometimes still called Batgaon. The devotee's city is located 13 kilometers on the east of Kathmandu and is a small peasant and craft town where the medieval look is still present, in particular thanks to the absence of cars. Bhaktapur was founded by the king Ananda Devamala during the 12th century and was the main center of influence in the valley between the 14th and the 16th century. The architectural and artistic remains of the city have been preserved as its Middle Ages atmosphere. Its narrow streets characterize Bhaktapur, its ancient houses with several floors and its old little shops. The most known activities there are craftsmanship, agriculture and small trade. Bhaktapur is well known for its pottery productions, its color festival, its traditional dances, or its way of life, extremely traditional, which make the place incredibly authentic. Despite the terrible earthquake in April 2015, which destroyed several buildings and deeply damaged the city for a long time, such as the capital and other cities, Bhaktapur preserved historical fabulous vestiges. There's an impressive amount of temples scattered in every street. The devotee's city is listed as World Heritage and would possess more temples than Kathmandu and the valley's other cities. Kumbatwa is the pottery place, one of the most fascinating places of the city where clay is always shaped on wooden wheels activated by hand. The number of the ochre tainted pots drying in the air attests to the artisan's ability. There are several basins in Bhaktapur. This one is near Bhimsen Temple. (laughs) 
The stupa of Swayabunat is one of the most beautiful monuments of Kathmandu. Standing on the hill on the west of the capital, you can see it from far. Even if it's a Buddhist place, Hindus come to venerate the sacred stupa. At the four cardinal points, the Buddha's eyes watch over. Like other ancient buildings of the capital, the temple underwent several destruction due to the earthquake. The monastery collapsed, which compelled the monks to do the ceremonies somewhere else further down, under a marquee, while the work for the reconstruction has started. From this sacred promontory, we see the capital, the valley and the mountains which surround it. And we can only be impressed by this poor country with a tormented geography which underwent five earthquakes since 1980. The country is enclaved between two oppressing giants, India and China. And its recent history encountered violent jolts such as a strong monarchy, the slaughter of the royal family, the struggle against Maoist rebels or long periods of political instability. Today's Nepal is in full transition. In its way to establish a genuine democracy and a modern state, one has to wish that Nepal would preserve its culture's originality and the integrity of the unique landscape it shelters. Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru zo Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru zo Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru zo Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru zo Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru zo Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru zo Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru zo Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru zo Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru zo Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru zo Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru zo Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru zo Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru zo Om tare tu tare tu re mama ye boni nyana bonding guru Thank you.